Hello everyone, I'm Gab Notley. BHP's 2023 financial results were announced a few weeks ago. It's been an important year operationally and for growth for BHP. And we have seen a lot of other factors impacting economies around the world, including inflation that has affected commodity prices and business globally. Shareholders are keen to understand what that means for BHP and how the company is seeing the future. So we've got lots to talk about today. In this session, our Chief Executive, Mike Henry, David Lamont, our Chief Financial Officer, and our Australian President, Geraldine Slattery, will answer questions that have been submitted by shareholders and give us some insight into BHP's priorities. We've actually had a number of questions about dividends, so I might start there. And Mike, perhaps I can put to you a couple of questions. The first is from Don, and he asks, I would like to know why the share price is going backwards when you're bragging about how well the company is doing, the unstable fluctuating price of the investment I am making. What I get in dividends does not make up for the loss on my original investment. And there's actually a second question from William. He says, with what confidence do you see BHP returning to profit levels of previous years, likewise dividends? Well, look, thanks, uh, Gab. And, um to answer the question, I'll start by saying that it was a very strong year performance-wise, and you can see that coming through our underlying operational performance, so the things that we control within BHP. The team's done a pretty good job of that on both an absolute basis, but also relative to the, the, the competition. Now, the answer to Don's question depends a little bit on, on when Don bought his, his, uh, his shares. Uh, what I can say is that if somebody had bought uh, BHP shares at the start of the last financial year, so July 1st, 2022, by June 30th, 2023, they would have returned 20%. So between share price and dividends, it was a great year. It was a 20% return for, for shareholders. Over a five-year horizon, so looking at it, at it over a bit of a longer-term horizon, uh, BHP has returned 15% per annum, total shareholder return compounded over that period. So again, a strong performance, both in absolute terms and relative to the ASX 100. We were, we've been the uh, largest dividend payer as well on the ASX 100 for the past couple of years uh, running. So again, the answer to the question depends a little bit on the, the, the specifics of when the, the investment was bought, but over reasonable timeframes like the course of a year or over five years, um, some pretty strong, strong numbers. We do have to recognize that we're in a, a cyclical industry. So coming back to the second question about levels of profitability and so on, key driver of profitability in the company is, of course, what's happening in commodity markets, and that sits outside BHP's control. What we do try to ensure is that we've got assets that are resilient at all points in the cycle, both on a standalone basis, but as well as, as the, the, the overall portfolio. And that's one of the things that's allowed us to generate these you know, very healthy returns over an extended period of time and to continue to grow value for shareholders and, and other stakeholders. Uh, David, is there anything else you'd like to add? Perhaps just taking a view around the cash flow and the stability of our overall margins, it's important to note that over the last decade, on average, our margins have been 55%, which is ahead of our peers. And if you look over that same 10-year horizon, we've delivered operating net cash flow around about, on average, $20 billion a year. So fairly stable despite that commodity movement that, that Mike referenced earlier. Um, the other thing that I would say is in relation to dividends, we do apply our capital allocation framework, which does stipulate that we will pay out a 50% of our underlying attributable profit to shareholders as a dividend. Now, if we have excess cash uh, after reinvesting back into the business, we will distribute that to shareholders as well. And our track record has actually demonstrated that. Thanks, David. Um, and the next question comes from Yvonne, and Mike, I'm going to um, put it to you. Yvonne says, please outline your company strategy for the next five to 10 years and advise, and advise us of new avenues for growth. I would like 100% transparency so I can make informed decisions. Well, we certainly want to be transparent, Yvonne, and it's, it's a really important question, actually, because at the end of the day, our strategy uh, and the choices that we make around strategy are what's going to drive value for you as a BHP um, shareholder. Uh, now, we have been very consistent in, in uh, the strategy that we've been pursuing for a number of years now. Uh, and that strategy involves us wanting to um, have a portfolio of assets that are first and foremost in the right commodities. And by right commodities, 
we mean those commodities that are positively leveraged, so, so have a positive correlation to some of the big megatrends that are underway in the world around us. And so if we think about what's happening in the world in the coming decades, we'll have ongoing uh, population growth, uh, rising living standards. There's obviously a big uh, um, shift towards people living in more urban centers, which tends to be metals uh, intensive. And we have the decarbonization thematic uh, uh, playing out as well. And so what we want is to be in commodities that stand to benefit greatest from those trends. Secondly, we want to um, ensure that, that within those trends, we're involved in commodities where we can generate significant margins. And, and David uh, spoke earlier about the, the very strong margins that we have relative to our competitors. We want to own large assets where we can create value at scale. So for the same management effort, we can create uh, uh, significant value for, for shareholders. And we want those assets to be sitting at the low end of the cost curve to ensure that they're resilient throughout the cycle, which is a point I mentioned earlier. So against that backdrop, we've had an effort underway in the company to streamline the portfolio. Uh, and that's been underway for a number of years now. More, most recently, we, we of course divested the oil and gas business and to, to uh, create a new company in, in Woodside. We've had an effort underway to optimize our coal portfolio, even as we then seek to grow in what we've termed future-facing commodities. And these commodities are potash, copper, and nickel which we believe um, have very strong uh, or stand to, to benefit strongly from the trends that, that I spoke about. That's on the portfolio front. Now, of course, for every dollar that we invest in those assets, we want to ensure that we're returning maximum value to you, our shareholders. And so we do have a, a, a very um, uh, strong and consistent focus on operational excellence as well. Uh, and then finally, social value. Um, we believe that, uh, that um, one of the things that will allow us to, to create and sustain high shareholder value over time is the, is the way that we ensure we're creating value for all of those stakeholders who depend upon and support BHP. And so we do have a differentiated approach to social value where we try to embed that thinking into all of the decisions that we make as a company such that we're pursuing um, greatest possible value for shareholders as well as in parallel creating value for, for the other um, partners that we, we, we engage with. Uh, and those three things, focus on operational excellence, having a differentiated approach to social value, and growing in future-facing uh, uh, commodities are the sorts of things that are allowing us to create the strong returns that I mentioned earlier, and which we believe uh, give BHP a very strong uh, shareholder value proposition going forward as well. Geraldine, anything you'd like to add on uh, performance this year? Yes, Gab. Um, look, if I could just maybe make uh, pick up on Mike's point on operational excellence, because I think it also calls out a point of difference for us in terms of strategy and performance. Um, it's what we call the BHP operating system. And this is a way of working that invests in culture and capability and ultimately drives high performance across the, the organization and, 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 our, and our assets. This is a journey we've been on now for, for about four years or more, uh, and the results are really starting to show that. And, you know, if I was to call out something from this financial year's performance, it would be Western Australia iron ore business is, is an excellent example of, of operational excellence. Thank you. Um, David, I might uh, direct this next question to you. Uh, we've had quite a few questions about markets and demand and where they're going. Um, shareholders are particularly interested in China. So I'd like to read two questions. The first is from Keith. He says, considering China's domestic financial problems and economic downturn and the resulting situation regarding steel production being reduced, how is this going to affect BHP and our iron ore exports generally for the future? Um, are you looking at new markets or positions? And a second question, what is your short-term and medium-term outlook on China and demand, and what impact on pricing? So thanks for those two questions, um, Gab. Firstly, let me just start that the Chinese economy has been quite volatile since the December 2022 when the zero COVID policy was eased. And we did see in the March quarter quite a strong performance. Uh, however, that tailed off in the June quarter. Uh, and so that volatility is present within the Chinese economy and we're paying attention to what plays out there. Equally, what is impacting the overall demand side of things is the anti-inflationary pressures and policies 
that other developing countries have actually put in place as well. So specifically within China, we have seen a tail off of the real estate sector. Now that is a sector of the economy that is quite prevalent in the steel usage. Uh, but it is important to actually note that that actually is only about one third of the overall steel demand that actually occurs in China. Outside of the real estate segment, we've actually seen some reasonable positions. Uh, that's come in the areas of manufacturing. Uh, it plays a little bit into Mike's earlier comment about decarb, and certainly we're seeing good copper usage um, coming through, specifically also motor vehicles and particularly electric vehicles have also been quite strong. So within China, we are seeing the government putting in place policies to revamp the real estate sector. Um, that's across a number of different areas. But at this stage, we haven't seen them actually get traction into the economy and have a pull through effect of the overall steel side of things. Um, so we're watching, uh, but I would also just flag that for the fifth year running, China will actually produce over 1 billion tonnes of steel. So uh, when people say the steel has fallen off, not really. Look at the last five years, um, we're certainly seeing it at the present, actually the run rate is ahead of last year. Um, so that does play well into uh, our iron ore uh, picture as such. But we are watching it closely uh, as much as anything. Um, we're also focused on India, which has become another important segment for us and market for us. It's been very good for our metallurgical coal and we'll continue to focus on that. So China and India, do provide some source of stability, but we are cautious on the new Chinese policies getting traction. Thanks, David. Um, the next topic is focused on Australian issues. So, Geraldine, I might um, ask for you to address these. We've had quite a few questions actually on uh, from shareholders on BHP support of the Yes campaign as part of the Indigenous Voice to Parliament referendum in Australia. Um, I'll read one from Elizabeth. She says... Why did the BHP board decide to use shareholder funds to influence an Australian social issue in the outcome of the voice referendum? Why would BHP move from their core business to a social commentator without any consultation with their shareholders? Many shareholders would be greatly opposed to the use of these funds to influence the outcome of the voice referendum. Thanks, Elizabeth. Let me perhaps start by saying that um, the upcoming referendum is a vote, of course, that will be taken by the people of Australia. And we understand and respect that there are diverse views uh, and perspectives on the matter. Now, with that said, let me talk through uh, the BHP perspective and why we support the voice. Firstly, in terms of social investment, we essentially look to invest um, where we can contribute to the communities where we operate and the environment. And we do that in a way that is aligned and supportive of our broader business priorities. And so within that, our relationship with traditional owners and other Indigenous stakeholders, these are some of the most important relationships we have at BHP. We operate on the traditional lands of Indigenous people at many of our locations in Australia and around the world. We partner widely with Indigenous communities with many long-term agreements. The relationships that we, we hold with traditional owners and Indigenous communities, they're really integral to our ability to run our operations, grow our business uh, and to the, the continuity of the business. Uh, and they're, they're integral, if you like, to the creation of long-term shareholder value. Now, we recently engaged with many representatives from traditional owner groups and Indigenous businesses, organisations, uh, as part of our work in developing our new Reconciliation Action Plan, or, or RAP, um, in Australia. And that was released in June. This confirmed to us that Indigenous stakeholders expected BHP to advocate for a voice, given we operate on um, traditional lands and work closely with traditional owners. The, the choice on 14th of October is the Australian peoples, as I've said, but hopefully this gives you some perspective as to why BHP supports a voice. 
Thanks, Geraldine. Um, the next question zooms back out um, to our view on commodities, and Mike, perhaps I can ask you to respond to Jeff. He says, world markets are predicting a future copper shortage. Is BHP planning any future expansion of copper production? So as I said earlier, Jeff, copper is, is one of the key commodities for BHP in terms of growth. And you might be pleased to know that BHP is the largest holder of copper resources globally. Of any company, we hold, hold more copper units. Of course, that's been enhanced further with the acquisition of Oz Minerals in the year past. Uh, this is in South Australia, here in Australia, where we purchased um, the, the Oz Minerals. Um, uh, well, Oz Minerals is a company which brought to us further copper assets in South Australia, with the intent there being that we'll be able to combine those assets with uh, the Olympic Dam asset, potential development of Oak Dam, which is a recent exploration play found by BHP, to create a new South Australian copper base. And, and over time, we uh, aspire to unlock further production growth from that integrated basin as well. Outside of Australia, we have copper assets in Chile, um, uh, Escondida. Uh, we are forecasting a bit of growth over the coming uh, few years. And then we have a lot of work underway to figure out how we can go about mitigating the effects of grade decline over time, which is one of the natural features of, of many of these uh, uh, copper deposits or copper production. Um, and we have further growth prospects that we're investing on both the exploration front and the early stage entry front. So it's a key area of focus for um, future facing commodities growth for, for BHP. And I'm happy to say that we're seeing a lot of success and the efforts of, of the past few years beginning to bear fruit uh, in terms of, of some early stage options, both within the, the existing assets that we have, as well as prospective new opportunities in uh, newly found deposits like Oak Dam or Ocelot in the US, as well as our early stage entry uh, options, the most recent one that we've uh, taken a toehold position in being a large uh, potential uh, or large deposit in, uh, in Argentina. So it's a you know, building momentum, uh, but coming off a very strong base with us being the largest holder of copper resources globally. Thanks, Mike. Um, David, this one for you, it's on spending. Um, this is a question from Susan. She says, I noticed CapEx is forecast to rise over the coming years. What's driving this increase? And what do you expect this will do to BHP's balance sheet? So, Susan, thanks for the question. And it's a nice uh, lead-in from Mike's response on, on the earlier question around copper as well. So you're right. Uh, firstly, we spent $7.1 billion in the last financial year on capital expenditure and exploration. And we have forecasts for the next two years for that to increase to $10 billion. And then medium term guidance is $11 billion uh, from uh, expenditure as such. Now, I will start by saying none of that's set in stone. We will obviously need to assess the opportunities and where the overall uh, prices are at from a commodity perspective and the cash flow that we're delivering. But what we do want to do is lever into the future facing commodities. So 70% of that capital expenditure and exploration will go towards future facing commodities. Now we have Janssen. Uh, stage one that is already in execution and potentially Janssen stage two, which brings us into the potash market, which is a great opportunity. Uh, equally, we are looking to continue to expand and optimise our Western Australian iron ore assets um, through some growth in the Pilbara. And then we're looking to lever into our copper portfolio, as Mike mentioned, uh, with the Oz Minerals assets coming in, how we continue to enhance the South Australian copper province for us, and also look at the opportunities do, that do exist in the South American operations, most notably at Escondida. So the spend for us is very much about leading into the demand that we see for our underlying commodities, and we think that investment ultimately will add to shareholder value. Now, all of that will be done on the back of our capital allocation framework, which does say that we'll run net debt between five and 15 billion. And we are indicating that with that additional capital expenditure and exploration, we'll be towards the top end of that uh, range as such, but still with a very strong and very healthy balance sheet. Thanks, David. Um, we have a few questions from shareholders around uh, interest in other minerals. Um, Mike, if I can, I might ask you to um, respond to these together. I'll read three of them out. Jeff asks, does BHP have any plans to enter the lithium mining production market? And Greg asks, 
What other minerals are BHP looking to expand into mining in the future? Your recent pathways into expanding the business basis away from being just an iron ore giant is obvious, but also wise. Would you be looking into rare earths and mineral sands down the track? And then Daryl asks, is BHP considering diversifying into hydrogen? So look, great questions. Um, and I, you know, I'll reference back to the question that Yvonne asked uh, early, earlier, Gab, in respect of, of strategy, because I kind of answered in there that you know, one of the things that we um, focus on is ensuring that we were involved in the right commodities and those commodities that stand to benefit greatest from the big trends underway in the world around us. But in addition, I said that we want to be able to invest in large assets where we can create value at scale uh, in commodities that um, offer us the opportunity to generate high, high margins and the assets have to be um, expandable. In addition to those points, the other things that we look at are um, whether the overall industry size is large enough for us to be able to build a substantial BHP uh, business. So if I look at rare earths, for example, uh, very interesting commodities, but the industry size is very small um, and so doesn't really offer an opportunity that would be of interest to, uh, to BHP because we'd be expending a lot of management time and effort on something that would only be a, a, a relatively small value business for the, uh, for the company. Um, the other thing that um, you know, we want to ensure is that any investment that we're making has to be uh, well aligned with BHP's existing capabilities or has to be something where we believe that we can create those capabilities and it's worth us doing so uh, over time. So something like hydrogen, for example, um, sits out, it's more of a, a kind of a chemicals processing effort and it, it sits outside of BHP's capabilities. That's one of the reasons why we wouldn't pursue hydrogen. And then if we look at lithium, it's a combination of capabilities for certain types of lithium uh, production. So brine, uh, lithium recovery from brine, for example. And we also have a belief that the, um, lithium is so plentiful around the world that over time you see a lot more lithium production being brought on and that the um, industry structure is such that you have a relatively flat cost curve, meaning that the margin opportunity offered up by lithium is less than it will be for some other commodities that we've chosen to invest in. Now, that's not to say that any of those commodities aren't going to be attractive commodities for some players, but we have to be able to ensure that we've got focused management um, uh, effort, uh, that we're targeting that focus on the commodities that we believe give us the greatest opportunity to create value for BHP shareholders at, at scale. Uh, and of course, you know, as David mentioned earlier, we do want to be able to deploy the BHP uh, capital allocation framework, which has stood us in such good stead since 2016 in a way that um, uh, doesn't see us um, lose impact through trying to deploy capital into too many differing uh, opportunities or commodities at the same time. And hence this choice around growing in potash, copper, and nickel. Um, the final point I would make here, because we have spoken quite a bit about growth and you know, we've spoken about the different commodities that we might want to, uh, to be involved in the sorts of assets and so on. We always have to remind ourselves, however, that the single biggest growth opportunity still for BHP today is the focus on productivity. Um, and it's something where over the past, uh, over recent years, we've unlocked a lot of shareholder value through the focus on operational excellence. And as Geraldine mentioned earlier, applying the BHP operating system, that is still the single biggest opportunity that we have ahead of us to create great, greater value or ongoing value for, for shareholders. Um, before we get to all of these other efforts we have underway around growing production. Thank you very much, Mike. Um, Geraldine, I have a question from David on safety that I would like to put to you. David says, having worked 44 years in the oil industry at a major hazard facility, safety had to be front and center in the mind of every employee, every minute of every day. What is BHP doing to address incidents in 2023 to ensure a safety target of goal zero is entrenched into the mindset of all employees as they go about their tasks? Th thanks, David, for that question. And look, I can certainly empathise having spent most of my own career in, in the oil and gas sector. So look, this past year, we, we, we did lose two of our colleagues um, in the workplace. And this is something that um, has been deeply felt across BHP and and really motivates us to double down on doing everything we can do to not just eliminate fatalities, but serious injuries and all injuries um, at BHP. 
Now, to give you um, a sense of what we're focused on, um, it's really those areas where we see the opportunity to make the, the biggest difference in, in creating a, a safer workplace. And um, these are also themes that are common across the mining sector. To, to call out perhaps a couple, uh, firstly, vehicular and mobile equipment more broadly at our mine sites. This is the single biggest contributor um, to uh, workplace uh, and safety events, represents about 40% of all accidents and near misses. Technology, automation, that provides part of the solution. Uh, and we're working with our peers in the industry and with the equipment manufacturers to improve safety of our vehicles. But the second point I'll call out, and you referenced it in your question, is really creating the right culture where we provide um, the, the skills, the training, the, the leadership that helps people make the right choices every day um, in a way that puts people first and creates a, a safer workplace. And this applies whether you work in the office supporting up our operations remotely or you're an operator or a maintainer on the mines. Thanks, Geraldine. Um, perhaps I could stay with you um, this is around an Australian policy issue. The question comes from Michael. He asks, if Federal Minister Burke is locking in $1.3 billion of additional costs under the new employment laws, why can't a matching cost reduction be achieved in your cost base? No, thanks, Michael. Look, the problem with the laws the government is proposing is that they will capture large sections of the Australian workforce. And that includes many thousands of very well-paid workers in the resources sector. Uh, and the resources sector, just to give you a sense of scale on that, the average pay is, is around 50% higher than the national average as it stands. And so the effect of this proposal is that it will make Australia, and in our case, the resources sector, uh, less competitive and more costly. And this comes at a time when global competition for investment in mining and minerals is dramatically increasing. To, to dive into the detail for a moment and to break down the broad concepts of same job and same pay, what that means is that a worker with decades of experience will, by law, have to be paid the same as a labour hire worker who's brand new to the business. And what does that do? It reduces flexibility, it undermines productivity, and it ultimately um, drives in inflation and threatens jobs. For shareholders, um, this is something that you should be very concerned about, because where does this additional cost um, come from? It comes from dividends and it comes from um, a superannuation investment. So as shareholders, it is something that you should be very concerned about. It's also why the Business Council of Australia, the National Farmers Federation, the Australian Chamber of Commerce, the Small Business Council, and many other uh, Australian businesses are taking a very strong position uh, on these laws. Um, we expect um, they and we will continue to argue the case uh, and seek to work constructively with government to get a better outcome um, on this. Thanks, Geraldine. David, anything you'd like to add on the costs? Yes, yeah, so let me just add that the original estimate that we did have uh, of 1.3 billion, we think now is actually light on. Um, we need to continue to evaluate exactly what the legislation will be, but let me be very clear. This, as Geraldine said, will have a direct impact to our shareholders. That 1.3 billion will come directly off our earnings for the year. That will then flow directly to dividends. We estimate that to be about 30 cents on a dividend payout. And that will, as Geraldine said, impact the 17 million Australians that hold BHP shares, either directly or through their retirement savings. So that's a direct impact uh, flowing through. And another way to look at it, that 1.3 billion is equivalent to around about 5,000 uh, jobs in BHP. So direct impact to all of our shareholders, not only in the dividends that will flow, but also off the earnings of the overall organisation. We've had a question on our climate um, targets. This is from Eileen. She's asked, um, in recent years, you've flagged ambitious 
emissions reduction targets. How, how are you progressing against them? Well, thanks for the question. Um, progressing really well. In, in short, we achieved a further 11% reduction in our operational emissions, so scope one and scope two emissions last year. Um, that's largely off the back of uh, um, renewable power purchase uh, agreements here in Australia because we'd already made significant progress in, in Chile. Overall, since 2020, which is our baseline here, we've achieved about or just over a 30% reduction. And this is against the backdrop of a 2030 target that we have as a business for a 30% reduction relative to the 2020 baseline. Now, of course, the question might be, if you've already achieved 30%, why is the 2030 target still 30%? But I think a really important point here for shareholders to, to understand is that that 20, 30, 30% is um, uh, over and above uh, underlying business growth. So we have to grow the business while still reducing um, emissions, absolute emissions by 30% over that period of time. And as I outlined earlier, uh, we are seeing the fruits of labor of our labors of recent years to develop more growth options starting to, to come to fruition. And so all going according to plan, we'll be growing underlying production between, you know, through to, to 2030, but at the same time managing to, to achieve a 30% absolute scope one, scope two emissions reduction relative to uh, 20, 20, uh, 2020 baseline. So it's a big achievement. Uh, we are on track and remain confident that it will be achieved. Um, and then we have a longer term uh, goal of being net zero operational emissions by uh, 2050. Um, and that's for scope one and scope two. Of course, for scope three, we're working with others in the um, supply chain, including ship owners, our steel mills customers, and so on, to support their efforts to decarbonize their um, uh, operations and, and, uh, as well. So strong focus on scope one and scope two, the things that we control, but not stopping there, working on some pretty ambitious efforts with, uh, with uh, customers and suppliers as well. Moving topics again, this has been in the news lately, and I know, Mike, you've been at, at conferences in Australia on this topic, but it's a question from Vanessa around our gender balance goals. She questions whether we're going to reach gender bal balance by 2025. In short, uh, we are pretty confident we are going to achieve our aspirational goal of gender balance by 2025, uh, Vanessa. We've made such remarkable progress since we initially set this aspiration out in 2016. From memory, around that time, the um, proportion of women in the BHP workforce was sitting at around 17%. We're now at 35% of the BHP workforce. My direct team is, is, is 50%, uh, so 50% both uh, of each of, of male and, uh, or men and women. Um, and about 40% of BHP leaders are now um, uh, women. Um, so we're well on, well on track. Uh, we've built momentum. Most importantly, as we've done this, through um, this combination of having a more, uh, more diverse perspectives being brought to bear on the challenges and opportunities that the company uh, confronts day in and day out, um, and through the inclusive culture that it's required us to establish in order to achieve the balance that we've achieved so far, we've seen improving underlying business performance. So hand in glove with this, uh, with this uh, you know, fairly significant transformation of the BHP workforce, we've seen improved safety, much higher productivity, more reliability, and better execution on uh, or against the, the, the strategy that we've laid out. So that gives me great confidence in the uh, journey that we're on. Um, and come 2025, uh, we will have a, a um, gender balanced workforce. I would also call out that we're all, you know, also focused on ensuring that we have um, uh, respectful behaviors throughout the organization, which has much broader diversity um, and inclusion benefits, and on increasing the proportion of the workforce that is uh, uh, indigenous. And um, you know, the south flank operation in, in uh, Western Australia, where we recently developed a large mine, that's about 15% uh, in, uh, indigenous participation in the workforce. In Canada, the Janssen project, when it's up and running in 2026, it'll be 20% indigenous and gender balanced. So lots of uh, successful examples across the company and, and as I said, really helping us drive this industry-leading um, uh, performance. That's all we have time for today. So Mike, David, Geraldine, thank you for taking the time and for all of your updates. A reminder to shareholders that the dividend payment date is 28 September and coming up later in the year, we will have our annual general meeting for shareholders. So please look out for updates on our website. And finally, a big thank you to all our shareholders for your ongoing interest and support.